I think there are two major modern temptations <clears throat> in how to resolve the family of nations question and the question that I posed at the beginning about the inheritance of Jewish history for the story of Jewish nationalism. And I think both of these temptations apply for the majority of the Jewish people who felt and continue to feel that the stories of emancipation and enlightenment, that is, the attempt to normalize the condition of the Jewish people alone, effectively failed. That is the climate that Zionism rises in in the late 19th century, operates under the belief that emancipation alone had failed, and therefore we need to answer these questions differently. The first great modern temptation for Jews in trying to escape or perhaps answer this problem has been to essentially abandon the idea that Jewish otherness will ever be fixed. To let go of the notion that the Jewish alienation from the family of nations will ever be redeemed. To give up on the idea that the Jewish people will ever be allowed to be normal. And therefore, to, just to embrace the kind of politics of normalcy, charting a course set by others, even though you'll never be allowed to be one of them. I call this movement Judeo-pessimism, and in doing so, I'm borrowing from uh, carefully, uh, borrowing carefully uh, and trying to apply uh, a literary scholarly movement known as Afro-pessimism. And for those interested in studying this further, a couple of the main thinkers who I've been reading to try to get a sense of this are scholars named Frank Wilderson, Saidia Hartman, no relation, um, and some colleagues of mine like Khalif Watkins, who have helped me to understand how this uh, intellectual movement has originated among uh, African-American literary scholars to, dis to define and describe the condition of African-Americans. Afro-pessimism understands blackness as a construct inseparable from racial hierarchy. Blackness is a slave identity that makes sense because it's born in a supremacist construct and it serves the political purposes of whiteness. Until whiteness, until colonialism, until the structure of white supremacy, uh, there is no blackness. In other words, it only gets invented in order to establish a construct, uh, to establish a contrast between whiteness and blackness. Afro-pessimistic th uh, thinkers argue that blackness, therefore, is fundamentally slaveness. And because this is its point of origin, they argue, it is basically irredeemable. There's no redemption story, no great reconciliation story between white and black. Afro-pessimist thinkers argue, therefore, that any incremental argument about civil rights or repair of white society to make it more hospitable to black people is ultimately a failure. It is an argument within a construct that is irredeemable that ultimately will never achieve actually achieving some sort of uh, racial equality. It, at the, perhaps the the central characteristic of Afro-pessimism is the disbelief in the possibility of racial redemption. Judeo-pessimism, similarly, would borrow the same logic and make a similar argument about Jewishness. It would be an ideology that understands that Jews have, a served, an, have served as with an essential function for people of the West. Jew has been the ultimate other that the West has used to order its world. It's a lot of logic to this and an extraordinary bibliography. The Jew may have a self-understanding of being something that's not the negative understanding through which the Jew is constructed, but the much more significant characteristic of how the Jew has worked in the West has not been the way in which Jews have defined ourselves, but the ways that we have been defined by others and that help the others make sense of their world. Sometimes this happens through the idealization of the Jew. More often, it happens through the demonization of the Jew. In either case, who the Jew is for the West is actually dramatically different from our own construct of self-understanding. A Judeo-pessimistic ideology would therefore argue that even though I wouldn't define myself as a Jew in this way, it would be a kind of acceptance, like Afro-pessimism is, of the terms of the game. This is, how, this is what the Jew means to the society in which we live. The Jew accepts that she never becomes, therefore, a member of the family of nations. 
the best she can ultimately attain, is some sort of begrudging tolerance over time. And the Jew then acquires his dignity, not by trying to be like others, but by refusing to care about being other anymore. If they set the rules, why would I abide by them? My objective might be to continue to survive, but to abandon the idea of reconciling, ultimately, between the Jew as other and the Jew as normal. I may try to participate in the family of nations because that's how the world operates, but I will give up on any idea that the gap between the Jew and the family of nations will ever be redeemed. The best example, I think, of this ideology of Judeo-pessimism is Pinsker. Pinsker is extraordinary uh, in many ways, and I, as I'll argue, I think actually Pinsker continues and endures in much of what passes today for uh, mainstream political Zionism. I think a lot of it is rooted in a kind of Judeo-pessimism, an, uh, an acknowledgement that the Jew remains essentially other, indefinitely so, and that I, even though I may try to play the game of the family of nations, I give up on the idea that the gap between the Jewish state or the Jewish people and the rest of the world will ever be, ever be reconciled. In fact, in many ways, whenever there emerges a new form of Jew hatred or Zionist hatred, it, it usefully affirms my sense of otherness. Right? Therefore, and that's the weird way, and we can talk about this more later, the weird way in which Israelis tend to understand the BDS movement is an affirmation of the next expression of the ways in which we are thought of as other. Pinsker is an incredible text in many ways, but what's amazing about it is, a, is its brutality about the, Jew, the otherness of the Jew and its secularity. Even though there's something about the argument that the Jewish people are other and different from other nations that sounds religious to it. It sounds theological, the same way that when people tend to talk about, even when Deborah Lipstadt spoke about anti-Semitism as having some essential qualities to it, that it, permute, it, it permutates and evolves in any society that we're in, that it almost has a theological quality to that. There's something about Pinsker's brutal sense of otherness that he doesn't say as being religious, and therefore it has something, there's something more brutal um, to it as a secular idea. If you notice the pull quote that Pinsker used at the beginning of the text, it's two-thirds of Hillel's statement. I love this. Strauss points this out also. The only thing he quotes is, if I am not for myself, who will be for me, and if not now, when? And the reader looks at it and says, wait a second, you missed that part? If I am only for myself? He didn't miss it. <laughs> He's leaving it out because that no longer is a useful definition of a Jewish moral fabric as relates to the other. What I also like about this is that at least Pinsker acknowledges by censoring the pieces of the text he doesn't like, he acknowledges in ways that no one else does that all of us simply picked the two out of three of Hillel's statement that we find to be most useful because it's actually morally overwhelming to take all three. <laughs> so Pinsker chooses the two that are most useful to him and leaves out the regard for the other. And he tells, the story he tells is one of a discovery or a stumbling on Judeo-pessimism as the experience of the result of the failure of emancipation. He says, we Jew, the Jews comprise a distinctive element among the nations under which they dwell, and as such can neither assimilate nor be readily digested by any nation. There is no resolution, so to speak, of the Jewish question. And as he says, uh, this doesn't mean, of course, that we must think of waiting for the age of universal harmony. This isn't going to work that way. There is no long-term messianic vision to correct the essential otherness of what it means to be in a Jew in the world. And therefore, it's not even if you can't beat them, join them. It's because they are trying to beat you, replicate them and stop worrying about uh, the fact that you may be corrupting your own moral sensibility. Our way of thinking about ourselves has to operate in, almost orthogonally to the way that other nations of the world construct their identity. 
He says at the end of the excerpt that I gave you, it's worth reading the whole piece, it's online. In seeking to fuse with other peoples, they, we, deliberately renounced to some extent our own nationality, yet nowhere did they succeed in obtaining from their fellow citizens recognition as natives of equal status. So worse, Jews thought that if we got rid of some of our Jewishness, at least we would get some yield, some return, in terms of being thought of like others. But ultimately, the Judeo-pessimist believes that uh, Jewish identity is a stain imposed by others that can never be whitewashed. Assimilation fails, emancipation fails, and it turns into political ideologies like that of Leo Strauss, who ultimately <laughs> argues, if I am basically other, and I am irredeemably and irretrievably other, I might as well lean into my otherness and figure out some version of articulating a positive Jewish identity. But for Strauss also, it's not on the basis of believing that that Jewish identity is fundamentally positive. It requires understanding that in a deep way, any version of Jewish identity emanates from being fundamentally and irreconcilably other. I didn't give this text from Strauss, but one of the most astonishing things Strauss writes, uh, which is in his, his book on Spinoza, but I think it captures very powerfully what he's trying to do here. He argues that the, um, he says, the Jew is the unique Western person, the Western individual who goes out into the world in pursuit of universal community, only to discover upon arrival that he is the only one there. And when he turns back and goes into his own community, that is what Strauss calls the Baal Tshuva, the person who is, who is repentant, right? The claiming of a religious identity emerges, and for him this is a historical 19th and 20th century story. It is not about the pursuit of some religious ideal, it is about the recognition, the deep, powerful, painful recognition that you can't be what you wish you could be, which is to transcend yourself. As he says in the excerpt that I gave you, I repeat, um, he says, uh, uh, there's no solution to the Jewish problem. The expectation uh, of such a solution is due to the premise that every problem can be solved. It is impossible not to remain a Jew. Right? There, you can try whatever you might to jettison your notion of otherness, but you are stuck with this identity. And as he'll go on to say in this article, you know, the, the title was Why We Remain Jews, and his answer is because we're not allowed any alternative. But he goes on to try to argue some sort of positive definition. There are a whole series of other representations of this, and we are not left with Strauss's choices, politically or religiously, about what we might embrace as our Jewish identity as a result of coming to this conclusion. Or put differently, you can be a right-wing Judeo-pessimist, or you can be a left-wing Judeo-pessimist. To many progressive Jews in America, the dominant expression of Jewish identity is the claim of ki gerim hayitem be'eretz mitzrayim. If you are a progressive Jew who believes that the most accurate characteristic of the Jewish condition is that we were once, uh, we were once others, we were once strangers in the land of Egypt, and that therefore obligates us to visualize, to understand all other others, to act upon them, Right? But your story is not one of the Sinai Covenant, but an in, in deep embodied sense of being fundamentally other, then you too may be a progressive, politically, Judeo-pessimist. Uh, Hannah Arendt falls into this camp also. Arendt embraces the notion of Jewish otherness, but argues as a result of that claim that what it means to be a Jew is to be identified with, um, to be an oppressed people requires of us to figure out what are the moral characteristics that an oppressed people should use to not simply accept being burdened by this identity by others, but to actually to make a claim that we stand for something beyond the oppression constructed by others. Whether or not we choose uh, either of these ideas, um, both of them emanate from a theory of Jewishness, which says that the Jew is fundamentally, irreparably, irredeemably other, and that whatever we construct as the, our Jewish spiritual or political identity does not try at the end of days to break the, 
the distinction to bridge the chasm between the Jew and the other family of nations. This idea lives and breathes on, as we're well aware, with uh, anti-Semitism. Wherever anti-Semitism recurs, it affirms a piece of the Jewish consciousness that the Jew will never be able to transcend being hated by others. As long as anti-Semites answer the question of Jewish difference, the Jew doesn't have to. Right? As long as they are policing the boundary, and this, there's a, something very tragic about, and I tried to ask this of, of Deborah the other night, there's something very tragic about the convenience through which anti-Semitism reinforces and reiterates Jewish identity without making any demands of us except to try to not be killed by it. It makes no, ultimately, an affirmation of one's otherness obligates us only in the morality of survival and, uh, and kind of exonerates us from the morality of trying to articulate that there is something essential about being a Jew that is not confined by, not understood by, simply being other. Jewish nationalism, as is embedded by Pinsker, and inasmuch as Herzl has picked up so much on Pinsker, and so much of political Zionism is predicated on this idea of Judeo-pessimism, remains a kind of fierce and dignified response. We are ultimately going to remain other, but perhaps through building our own nation state, perhaps by having our own army, we don't think that it solves for anti-Semitism. No political Zionist believes that the creation of the state of Israel ended anti-Semitism. In fact, in some ways, it simply consolidated it in various forms um, uh, in, and in, in the context of other nations who still are intent on destroying the nation of the Jewish people. So Jewish nationalism doesn't solve the problem of Jewish otherness, but at least it offers the Jew some measure of dignity. It offers some dignity against being other. I'm other, but at least I have an army to fight back uh, if I'm pushed to that place. Sometimes Judeo-pessimism can produce a moral discourse, as I indicated, a moral discourse of trying to at least argue, I can't resolve my otherness, but I should be able to positively articulate what is the moral characteristics of who the Jewish people are supposed to be in the world, to say, I refuse to have my moral imagination tied into the moral imagination of the West or whichever society is defining me as other. It can produce a moral discourse, but it can also produce a political crudeness best captured by the phrase realpolitik. Realpolitik is also politically a result of the idea of Judeo-pessimism. Since ultimately, right, my, I will never be allowed to be part of the family of nations, since ultimately I don't trust the rules put in play, the rules of engagement dictated by a West that will not have me as a member, I will do whatever I need to do in order to build my nation state and survive. Sometimes the same people believe that they are articulating a moral vision for the Jewish people as enacting a real politique in their politics. But I would suggest that over time, if your dominant political ideology is real politique, that might actually be your value system. Right? At a certain point, it becomes inseparable. There's a second alternative to Judeo-pessimism, and one that I also want to struggle against today. The second alternative to Judeo-pessimism is religious messianism, the story that says that the otherness of the Jewish people can be redeemed by God acting in history, and as it usually manifests itself in the 20th and now 21st century, a religious messianism is defined as confirmation that God is on our side, a religious confirmation uh, of what it is that the Jewish people do. The story of religious messianism in the 20th century, especially post Six Day War, and now as we inherit it in the early 21st, believes, unlike Judeo-pessimism, that this problem of Jewish otherness can be redeemed and repaired, and believes it's already happening. It tends to, as a result, not particularly hold the Jewish people to some transcendent moral standards. 
right? It, ha- it, res- it results in a kind of affirmation of who the Jewish people are, what the Jewish people do, and, and to demonstrate the way that God is acting in history. I want to suggest today that the rabbinic tradition doesn't like either of these choices, either Judeo-pessimism or the belief in a kind of messianism that affirms empirically the political realities of the Jewish people. I want to argue that the rabbinic tradition attempts to thread a line, arguing that the Jewish people are a nation, not quite like the other nations, but that the path to normalcy is not simply by approximating the national character of the other nations, not simply acting like them, but by trying to preserve our moral character as somewhat different than that of the nations of the world, and eventually seeing the normalization of the Jewish condition in some sort of redemptive and messianic story. That is to say, our obligation, even as we see ourselves as other, is to hold on to the discourse of the covenant, to believe that we are about something that other nations are not about, not ultimately in order to simply transcend them, but to belong to the same family of nations. All nations have some character. All nations have some piece of responsibility. The redemptive story of the rabbinic tradition, unlike Judeo-pessimism, is that one day this story will be redeemed. But that doesn't happen merely by God acting on our side. It happens through our commitment to our moral character. In other words, though the rabbis detest the nationalists of their time, as you saw in this text from Kiddushin, there might be a redeemable nationalism that we can locate and maybe use. If we look briefly at the Kiddushin text, I want to spend most of our time on the Gemara from Avodah Zarah, as I said, which I hope you enjoyed kind of a blast of a piece of Talmud. Um, if you look briefly at the story from Kiddushin and just hold, hold your hand on that page seven and flip back to Herzl for a second. Herzl had said in the line before we read together, an amazing thing, he says, therefore I believe that a wondrous generation of Jews will spring into existence. The Maccabeans will rise again. Like really? That's who I want? I want these guys on page seven? The Hasmoneans, who are described as massacring the sages, of course, historically, this text is all over the place. What we know as the rabbinic tradition doesn't emerge till a couple of centuries later. But the imagination of the rabbis about the, um, about the Hasmoneans is that they are conquerors of land. That's the primary first thing that, um, Yo- that King Yanai is associated with, and it's historically accurate. The thing that King Yanai, Alexander Yanai does, and then John Hyrcanus, is they massively expand the borders of the land of Israel, conquering surrounding tribes. They are fixated with their own dignity and honor, and ultimately they, are, um, they consolidate religious and political authority in ways that the rabbis consider scandalous. And anyone who challenges that idea, who challenges their failure to adhere to a kind of separations of powers, gets massacred, right? And the construct that gets created is between the rabbis, who are the people who inherit the tradition, and the kings, the Hasmoneans, who are the ones who destroy it. So it's easy to see why the rabbis detest their nationalism. And I guess I read Herzl, a rabbinic Jew, and ask, I myself as a rabbinic Jew, do I have to to accept the Maccabees to reawaken the possibility of Jewish history. Now the alternative is a little bit worse, to reject the stuff of Jewish history and to feel that the, that the experience of living as a modern Jew without precedent is how I'm supposed to construct a Jewish political identity is much worse. We as Jews like to believe that we're a people of memory, that the stories we get before us help to inform and shape who we are in the present. I don't want to say with the great hubris that we Jews living in Jewish history are living in unprecedented times. Unprecedented times for a Jew is much harder than a period of precedent I have to reject. Nevertheless, I'm stuck in some ways of trying to hold on to some notion of continuity from the rabbinic tradition into this nationalist story, even though the very antecedents that Herzl would ask us to hold on to are the antecedents that religiously, morally, and spiritually we're obligated to reject. I want to read um, one text before we get to Avodah Zarah, which is just to notice the short Jewish political theory that emerges for the rabbis in Mishnah Avot, which is on page 8. 
Mishnavot says something amazing, and I think it's lost by the fact that these two Mishnayot are juxtaposed to one another, but they seem to start new Mishnayot. And sometimes when we read Avot, we're inclined to believe that these are all like separate epigrams, separate little rabbinic traditions. But embedded right here in this text is a rabbinic political post, Hasmonean political theory, which is as follows. Akavia ben Mehalalel would say, Histakel bishloshad varim. Look at these three things and you won't come to the way of sin. Know from whence you came, know where you're going, and know before whom you are uh, ultimately going to give an account and reckoning from where you came, from a putrid drop, from where you're going, a place of dust and worm and maggot, before whom are you destined to give an account and reckoning before the king of kings, the holy blessed one. The theological posture of the Jew is meant to be one of profound humility in standing before God, melach malchei hamlachim. And then the second line, Rabbi Hanina skan hakoanim omer, Rabbi Hanina, the vice priest, high priest would say, pray for the welfare of the government, for the Malchut in this context has to be Rome, for were it not for the fear it inspires, every man would swallow his neighbor alive. In other words, worship God and pray for Rome. Not pray to Rome, worship God and pray for Rome. This is the political theory of Chazal in a nutshell. The ultimate vision of what it means for us to be Jews is to be the people of God who obey God's vision for the world. We don't pray to Rome, however. We trust in political structures, never conflating the two. That which we adhere to theologically is not the same as the instrumental infrastructure that we depend on in order to live in a world that it does not have abundant God's presence in it. These are meant to be totally different commitments, and they are, what's powerful is that they are located sequentially in the same Mishnah, right? That these are meant to be read, I think, uh, together. The political system is defined by others. Jews are not actually in that game, right? Hanina Skana Kohanim is not giving a pathway for Jews to run for elective office. He's not describing that that's our political system in which we have to see ourselves as participants. The best that the Jew will believe in as a political ideology is that politics are an instrument, but never ultimately our religious identity. I want to especially, however, read this story, magical story in Av Avodah Zarah. And I want to make... Uh, I think 11 points about the Gemara. But I'm going to trust the fact that you read through it so, you, so I can make reference to things that you've seen. The first thing I want you to have noticed or think about is that the, the story is located, it's situated in Tractate Avodah Zarah, the tractate of the rabbinic tradition about idolatry. What's wonderful about this tractate in general, some of you who were in my elective last week, we talked about this a little bit there, is that Avodah Zarah emanates from an amazing, um, an amazing challenge that the rabbis have as historically situated text, in that we inherit the Bible, which, which in understands idolatry to be something that is incredibly other from the religious identity of the society that the Israelites are meant to create. And then they find themselves in the Roman Empire, <laughs> uh, swimming together in a social, political, and religious world in which idolatry is not so easily defined. All right? So it would be nice if idolatry looked like a tree to Asherah or a shrine to Baal. Once I can define it as that, I can chop it down, I can destroy it, etc. But what happens when idolatry is simply a way of life in a Roman Empire? So the whole premise of the tractate of Avodah Zarah is already rooted in the Jew mixed in, in some ways, to the family of nations and trying to not only articulate a theory of what Avodah Zarah is, how do I define that, but trying through that same process to figure out who we are in that story. And so many of the stories within Tractate Avodah Zarah are an attempt to differentiate who are the we and who are the them. As I said before, the Judeo-Pessimist doesn't actually have to articulate the we. As long as they define us as who we are, I don't have to worry about offering some kind of vision of self-definition for myself. 
but so much of Tractate of Odazara, and this is the first story in the Tractate, is trying to figure out who are we as a nation and who are they as a nation. What are their primary characteristics and what are our major moral characteristics in contrast? I alluded to before that this, is a, this seems to be a sermon. Uh, Jeffrey Rubinstein has a lovely article about this in which he makes that case as well. Um, and it seems to be a sermon that might have been given on the holiday of Sukkot, which you might have discerned by the end of the story. It comes around in a good sermonic way. <laughs> Why are we talking about this week's Parsha? Right? You get there right at the right time. Um, you notice one of the, some of the tells literarily and structurally of why this has a sermonic quality to it is that you, I hope you picked up on all of the references in this story to other Talmudic texts. So this is a late compilation of a rabbinic corpus. Um, may have been confusing of like, wait, I recognize that, that whole business of holding the mountain above them, right, like an overturned um, cask. That the Gemara, in other words, knows of these references from other places, and in a good kind of Dvar Torah sermon way, is weaving together all sorts of stories, ideas about commandedness. You have even that uh, references to the Bar Yochai story are located in here as well when it talks about the characteristics of Rome. The speaker, perhaps Rav Simlai, weaves them together as part of a much bigger story trying to articulate a core idea about Jewishness and ultimately a core idea about Sukkot, which we'll talk about later on. But I did want you to pick up on how um, the structural integrity of this piece of Talmud um, and the kind of bob and weave that the, that the author is doing throughout, picking up on all of these different ideas. The story starts with the Torah being located in God's lap. God takes the Torah and calls all of the people in the world into judgment. And here's one of the most amazing things in the whole text. Everybody, everybody comes in together. Right? All of the nations gather together. And who's responsible for keeping the story of nationalism alive? God. The first move of this text is suggesting that the division of nations into nations doesn't just matter now as a description of the world as it is, but seems to matter to God as an imagination of the world to come. There is no ultimate teleology in the story in which all of the people of the world come into judgment together. No collapsing of difference, no conflating of the nations together into one group, into human beings. It seems to matter in some essential existential way that all of the nations come in separately and retain their national character of their people, some enduring value of establishing the character of a people through their identity of a nation, trying to figure out what do each of these nations stand for and the refusal to think of all of the peoples of the world as just one big collection of people. You would think that if, you, if it was really an anti-nationalist text, you would think what would happen would be that all of the nations would come in in their groups and that God, theoretically the great universalist, would mix them together. But the reverse actually happens. They think that what they're supposed to do in this universal redemptive age is to stream together collectively. And God says, no, no, stay in your groupings. And that will become a tell to figure out what is the character of Rome and, and in that process, what is the enduring character of who the Jewish people are supposed to be about. The question that God asks them is magnificent. God says, with what did you occupy yourselves? A different way of asking this question is to ask any nation, what was the dominant value that you were committed to? If nationalism is merely a political instrument, if nations don't actually ask, what do we stand for? What are our committed ideals? Then it is not just a political instrument, but it is a morally vacuous and humanly divisive political instrument. I like thinking about this, even domesticating it further. If you were asked, not just what does it mean to be part of a Jewish people, and therefore what are the characteristics of your people or your nation, it would be amazing to think about if somebody said to you, what are the dominant values of your family, of your tribe, of your neighborhood? If you can't articulate them, it doesn't mean that they don't exist. It just might mean that you don't talk about them enough. It doesn't, might mean that you don't foreground them enough. You don't actually create covenantal structures to hold yourself accountable to what you consider to be the dominant story. 
We, what we, I think, are doing, however, in this text is starting off by God asking Rome, what did you occupy yourself with? And I think the Jewish reader is supposed to start getting nervous, <laughs> right? Because even though the Jews win by the end of this story, they win conditionally. They win on the basis of, were we supposed to be committed to something all along? <laughs> Did I forget something? What was supposed to be the dominant story that defined the characteristic of the Jewish people? If we, as if to say the Talmud asks, if we get asked that question with what did you occupy yourselves, would we be as capable or better capable of answering that question than all of these other nations? Rome claims, right, in answer to the question, this is where it's quoting from Bar Yochai, from the Gemara about Bar Yochai in Tractate uh, Shabbat. Rome says, yeah, we, everything we did, we did for the benefit of the Jewish people and God, right? We built bathhouses, we did, etc. And God, an God's answers is that these answers are insufficient markers of a nation's character. If the only thing you can answer when asked about the enduring value of what you gave to the world was a cherry tomato or even a microchip, right? If on, the only thing you can answer are technological advances that you claim actually had moral character associated to them, they made the world better for other people, but you could easily see through those as mechanisms to also get wealthier and to dis define the character of your people by its technological advancement, you will, be un you will be demonstrated to have advanced a vision of the character of your people that you claim served the world, but ultimately served you. The other nations come in next, wondering whether perhaps their shortcut is simply that Rome gets set aside, Persia gets set aside, but maybe those nations got set aside uh, because of, at a vengeance for having persecuted the Jewish people. God's answer is no. The fact that Rome and Persia come first and second, I think they're telling us in the public imagination of those who are going to read this story, obviously Rome comes first. That's the big one. Persia comes second. That's also a big one. But God seems to be paying attention to the independent existence of all of the nations of the world, independent of the extent to which they interface with the Jewish people. My wife Stephanie tells a story about her... Um, her whole Jewish history sequence in her day school uh, when she was a kid was narrating, oh no, not Jewish history, global history, world history, was narrating global history from the perspective of its impact on the Jewish people. <laughs> Now, what's great about this is that it enables you to take about 75% of the globe and not have to study that history um, because there are so many minor, right? The, the interfacing of Jews with, um, with most of planet Earth has been actually relatively minimal. And so I can just study like certain sections of world history and ask what ways were the good for the Jews and bad for the Jews. Um, this is like the theological alternative in this text right here of God saying, no, it's not just about, I'm not just looking to punish Rome and Persia because of the extent to which they were good for the Jews and bad for the Jews. I'm also trying to assess to what extent all of the other nations can be evaluated based on their moral character, their commitment to the idea of Torah, or even as we see to the Noahide laws, regardless of whether or not they were quote unquote good for the Jews or not. I love the question that the Talmud goes on to ask about fairness. Was it actually fair? Did everybody get a fair shot at this? I like that the Gentile nations of the world say to God, but it's not fair. You didn't give us the Torah in the same way that you gave it to the Israelites, right? Didn't, first they try and say, you didn't offer us the Torah, and we find all sorts of proof texts that say, no, no, God shopped around the Torah, but all the nations of the world reject it, and they say, no, no, no. You held it over the Israelites, forced it upon them. That seems to have given them an advantage. If you had forced us to do it, uh, then perhaps we would be the same. And I just, I, one of the reasons I love about this is um, it's, it suggests to me that the, the rabbis here are actually asking that question about themselves. They're not asking about the nations of the world. They're asking themselves, are we only committed to this coercively? 
did we actually take it seriously as a voluntary commitment and one that signaled our profound willingness to be in relationship to God and Torah? The fairness question that they're asking is not in the voice of the Gentiles. The fairness quest question they're asking is about probing or mining their own anxiety about the extent of our commitment. Had we not been forced, would we ultimately hold on to this covenant? I especially sneak, I like the, especially like that they sneak in this question about the Gentile who studies Torah, as if to say, maybe we're holding too fast ourselves to our own boundaries of ethnicity and nationhood, and maybe it's actually possible for other nations to be as pious as we are. Maybe the boundaries that we erect, that we create between the Jewish people and others aren't ultimately serving Torah, right? Because a Gentile who studies Torah becomes like the high priest. Maybe those boundaries aren't serving Torah, but are serving or fueling our own um, ethnocentrism. What the rabbis want to make clear, they dying for, is that what makes a Jew a Jew is a commitment to the commitments that a Jew is supposed to be committed to. I'm not going to repeat that. I'm sorry. It just came out that way. That's what makes a Jew a Jew is a commitment to those commitments, and it is not simply an attachment to the national belonging of a Jewish people that should, can be considered morally or halachically significant. I like that God calls a whole series of witnesses Right? to demonstrate that the Jews have actually been faithful. This is where I think the Gemara is wishful. Right? I don't think this Gemara should be read as the rabbis empirically believing that the Jewish people have actually done the covenant. We have good data to the effect that we haven't, which is all of Tanakh. <laughs> right? um, we know that that's not actually the story. This is a wishful imagination using as our key examples moments when Jews and non-Jews were in tension with each other and where in those moments the Jew wound up resisting the temptation of the other. Nim the story of Nimrod, the story of Joseph and, um, and the wife of Potiphar. These are stories in which our tradition imagines that we separate ourselves from their ways, but not as mere ethnocentrism, but as part of an obedience to some sort of higher order. We remained committed to the covenant, even though it would have been really easy <laughs> to cross over and not. This again is a text of rabbis in the Roman Empire asking of themselves, what are the religious activities that we do which signals, even though we can fit in and blend in perfectly well with this society, what are the activities that we do which signal our commitment to something transcendent? Like I said, I don't think the rabbis really believe the Jewish people fulfilled the Torah. This is a text of pleading, of aspiration. When we're asked, the rabbis are asking what we are and what we'll answer, right? We're trying, this is a text begging the Jewish people to be able to answer this question better than the Romans answer it for themselves. This is a text hoping and praying that we will be able to answer this in the most powerful way. I, I think it's a love story, this, uh, this sermon, of who the Jewish people could be. Right? What could we be? The biggest idea of the text, however, is that if the Jewish people are going to hold on to the notion that we are a people, a nation like all of these other nations who are brought before God, if we want to endure into eternity, what will allow us to make this claim is the claim that we also endured for the sake of Torah, that there was something bigger and deeper about who we are supposed to be in the world than simply simp being a nation like all other nations and in the covenant. And here's the most radical idea of the text, is that at the end of days, nations stick around. They don't disappear. They get made fun of by God, right? I love that, right? God teases them, but it's, there's something endearing about the teasing. Right? It's not an end of day's vision that all of these peoples become collapsed into one. It is not a Christian or Muslim universalist vision that everybody adheres to the same theological sets of belonging. In the end of days, we have perhaps a primacy of place, but there's all this room left for the other family of nations. Our otherness, this story suggests, gives ways to a different form of redemption where what's left is a family of nations that remains intact. 
This is an extraordinary vision of the end of days that, again, does not try to claim that Jews throughout history lose their sense of otherness. They obviously are other and different from the nations of the world, but does not also claim at the end of days that otherness disappears. But what gets left behind is a powerful image of the family of nations. So why Sukkot? Why tell this story on Sukkot? I think there are a few things going on here. The first is Sukkot is the political holiday of Second Temple Judaism. We know this from a lot of sources. We know it from Josephus, for who describes um, the holiday of Sukkot as the time of inflamed political tensions, eight days of marching into the temple and around the temple, shouting battle cries like Hoshana, um, with a set of um, uh, a set of produce, right, the lulav and etrog, that are imagined throughout Second Temple iconography to look like swords and weapons. These are the ho- this is the holiday, not just of spiritual redemption, but of political redemption. A holiday of pilgrimage to Jerusalem that felt dangerous and hot, and gets described as a result, therefore, in the New Testament and elsewhere, as times when radicals could exploit the political sensitivities in Jerusalem and turn them into chaos. Josephus describes rioting that took place in the temple in Jerusalem when the high priest performed the rituals incorrectly and gets stoned by the peoples at Trogim. Jesus describes marching on the temple in Jerusalem with palm fronds in their hands. It gets moved in the liturgical calendar from Sukkot to Pesach, but it's Sukkot. The celebration of the holiday of Hanukkah, of all things, is the reenactment of the Sukkot festival three months later because they couldn't celebrate it at the time. Sukkot is the holiday of Jewish nationalism in the Second Temple period. And what's extraordinary about this text, therefore, is that it is imagining on Sukkot a vision of uh, sovereignty of God over everybody else as opposed to sovereignty of the Jewish people over the land of Israel. If I wanted to tell a story on Sukkot that held on to that sense of nationalism, of the value of the national character of the Jewish people, but I wanted to disconnect it from the politics of the Second Temple period, I would still make it Sukkot, but who ultimately rules over at the end of days? God and not the people Israel. The nations are unified, as we, as we understand from the book of Zechariah and otherwise, streaming towards Jerusalem as the capital of the world. They remain nations, however, and sovereign in the story is not the Jewish people over their oppressors, but God all over all of the people. I think the story of Sukkot also picks up on the fourth chapter of Jonah. Right, God says, do one thing. What do, you want? what do I want you to do? It's an easy one. The rabbis go back and forth. It's not so easy. It's hot outside. What do I want you to do is just build a sukkah. And then when they go to build their sukkah, God makes it really hot, right? And they kick over their sukkahs. And my favorite line in the whole Gemara is it says, um, it's okay that it, I, a person who's suffering is allowed to go inside. And then the Gemara is like, yeah, but they shouldn't have kicked their sukkahs. <laughs> Right. Um, right. You can go inside, but you should still not spite the actual sukkah itself. This is the same thing that happens in the fourth chapter of Jonah, right? When Jonah is sitting outside and it becomes and, and God is providing for him, and then it becomes too hot and everything dies, and Jonah starts whining. The story of Jonah in this place is God reminding Jonah that God doesn't actually care about the Jewish people or even about him. The way I read that story of Jonah is when is God's claim to Jonah, I never cared about you. <laughs> you were an instrument to something larger. Similarly, I, it's not that I care about the Jewish people as opposed to everybody else. I care about the Jewish people because they are an instrument for the bringing of Torah and covenant into the world. You became fixated and obsessed with being taken care of as though that's what this is ultimately about. You became fixated with the particular, forgetting that the particular is always in service of the universal. And when you forget that, right, when you think it's entirely about you, Torah doesn't win, covenant doesn't win, we think that we are supposed to be better than others. 
I think the use of the Jonah story here is about some notion of rabbinic self-awareness, that any victory story for the Jewish people and the family of nations has to be a victory for God, Torah, and covenant, and not simply for the Jewish people themselves. I gave you also this short piece from my teacher uh, of blessed memory, or of Amital, who suggests that part of the reason that the sukkah is so powerful in this story is because um, our national aspirations as the Jewish people know that they are fundamentally temporary. The fact that they get destroyed doesn't mean they can't come back again. That's who the Jewish people are, getting knocked down and built up again. And therefore, the Jewish people's story is a story of optimism. The fact that you get destroyed does not become the teleology of your story. You do not become the enduring other. There is always a way to be able to rebuild who the Jewish people are supposed to be. This is a rabbinic story, um, and it is uh, undoubtedly still hegemonic. Right? Rabbis do, rabbis imagine that the Jewish people do win at the end of days they do imagine that the Jewish people are left with some version of a political thriving that is different, right, than the one that we're living in now. It is messianic, right? It is triumphalist. But look at the contrast between this story and the Gemara that we read in Kiddushin. The rabbis are skeptical about the the shallow political messianism of the Hasmoneans, instead are looking for a vision of the end of days to imagine what is possible for the Jewish people. And at this end of days, it is not a story of Yohanan of Hyrcanus or Alexander Yanai simply conquering the other nations of the world. It is not simply a triumph militarily of a, over the rest of the family of nations, but the vision that the rabbis offer at the end of days is a family of nations with the Jewish people as part of it. One of the idiosyncratic features of Jewish peoplehood is that unlike most other nationalisms, and this is for better or worse, we as the Jewish people always try to integrate some sort of religious or moral mission into our idea of family. This is what Daniel spoke about on the first day. If we we simultaneously want this secular story of family turned into peoplehood, turned into nation, And at the same time, we try to hold on to some notion that what makes us a unique family, a unique people, and a unique nation is a commitment to something religious, moral, and transcendent that cannot simply be reduced to the the pure uh, human anthropological need for belonging. That That in and of itself is not sufficient. I wonder what it means for us today to try to avoid the powerful temptation and the powerful attraction of Judeo-pessimism. There's a certain kind of nationalism that stems from Judeo-pessimism, a nationalism of resentment that believes that what it's supposed to do is to simply accept this fate that is bestowed upon the Jews and then to kind of... um, spit back a moral discourse to the world that is inherently cynical about what the world wants for the Jewish people. It's extraordinary how in 70 years, the Jewish people's experience of the United Nations, of the attempt by the world to construct some sort of normative shared morality has become so flipped that for many Jews and especially Zionists, if it's said by the United Nations, it is inherently morally flawed, <laughs> right? That is, a, that is a profound triumph of Judeo-pessimism, the skepticism that anything that is said by the nations of the world to the Jewish people is not just something that has to be evaluated on its merits, but has to be thought of fundamentally um, as inherently morally flawed. Judeo-pessimism doesn't have to do this, but it oftentimes winds up embracing otherness that in turn shapes our field of vision in how we relate to other others. Again, it doesn't have to, right? You could be, you could so lean into your sense of otherness that it created empathy, the capacity to experience other others uh, in the same way, but it almost inevitably has some qualities when attached to nationalism, which makes it very hard to reconcile somebody else's otherness. My colleague Alex Kay describes the challenges for Jews in America this way. He says, um, 
He says, if Jews were the dominant other of the West, the problem for Jews in America today is that we showed up in a country where there was already another other on which America was constructed. And the challenge for blacks and Jews in America is to figure out how to make their their otherness, which is so definitional to the societies in which we in, we're in, as tools for relationship building as, a, as opposed to tools for competitive otherness. Right? It's much easier, however, when this notion of Judeo-pessimism is wedded to a nationalistic story to embrace one's otherness and to use it as a means of obscuring or occluding our field of vision for other others. Which one? <laughs> yeah. Um, Alex Kay uh, has argued that if the Jew is the other to the West, right, that, um, that the, the West doesn't exist without the Jew as its other, America doesn't exist without, um, without blacks as its other. The dominant stories of America don't exist without an other. And this, one of the central problems that Jews and blacks face in America today is that we, have enc we encounter a country as Jews in which we're not actually the dominant other. And it could be, you could imagine that that could be a point of a hinge for the black and Jewish experience to actually figure out how to leverage that sense of shared otherness. But more often than not, groups that embrace their sense of otherness use it to block their field of vision for somebody else's otherness. When, when this is especially attached for Jews to a story of Jewish nationalism, if I'm leaning into my otherness, other people's otherness can become inconvenient. Judeo-pessimism, as I said, doesn't tolerate the possibility of redemption, and I wonder whether part of the other problem of the kind of Zionism that emerges for Judeo-pessimism is that if you don't believe in the possibility of redemption, you'll never seek it in the world. You won't work for it. You won't try to fix the challenges that, it, that provide. Um, you wind up being convinced that of a nationalism that sees Judaism as a stain of identity, not realizing that the more you think about it as a stain of identity, you make that stain darker and darker. There's no passivity. Or there's no, um, with no redemption, there's no work towards redemption. And there is no equilibrium of status. The more that you embrace your otherness, the more you will ultimately seek to make it um, more, uh, more pronounced. I wonder whether Judeo-pessimism, even though I think it's actually believed in by many American Jews, ultimately makes no room for diaspora in its own vision of the future. There's no way, according to a Judeo-pessimist, for a Jew ever to be at home, especially outside of a society that you're constructing for yourself. And I don't believe that any version of Jewish nationalism that cannot make sense of the contemporary experience of diaspora Jewish at-homeness is destined to fail the Jewish people. Watch all the ways in which Judeo-pessimistic nationalism looks so perplexed at American Jews um, and says, how is it possible that you think that this is actually going to work out for you? If you ultimately feel that the teleology of all diaspora is to fail, if there is no possible redemption between the Jew and the non-Jew, there's no room within a nationalism that comes out of Judeo-pessimism to make any sense of diaspora. And in that moment, the story of Jewish nationalism becomes, paradoxically, not the continuation of Jewish peoplehood, but the enemy of Jewish peoplehood. Jewish nationalism, I still think, however, as we read in this rabbinic story, needs some kind of messianism, but not the kind that sets us above the other nations, not a kind of nationalism that ultimately makes we think that we're right, but the nationalism that's imagined in this story in Avodah Zarah is one that seems to demand of the Jewish people to ask what's at the core of our project. What keeps us apart is not simply the persecution. God doesn't care about the persecution by Rome and Persia. What God cares about is that Rome didn't do enough to pursue the Torah. What we are ultimately supposed to use as the measure and metric, the impetus for our own actions as a, as, a, as a nation in the world, is a commitment to our covenant in spite of the fact that the shortcut of simply being the people oppressed by Rome or Persia would be sufficient to sustain our identity. Rabbis know that. 
You're going to stay a Jew simply because they're going to make you a Jew. But I refuse to allow that to be the mechanism by which I define the moral character of our people. What makes us Jewish is not the people who are persecuted by Rome or Persia or Germany or whoever else. We are the people who remain indefinitely committed to the story of the covenant. The truth is, I don't know that there's a Jewish story, ultimately, of belonging in the family of nations that would make us radically equal without some notion of religious triumphalism. This Gemara and Avodah Zarah isn't it. This doesn't end with everybody is on equal footing. God, after all, is laughing at some of the people. But I think our rabbinic story does offer something of a pathway for the present in which our commitment to constantly interrogate what we are about, what defines us as a people, those things differentiate us from the family of nations that they sometimes feel costly. If we're talking about ourselves as a people who are committed to something transcendent, yeah, there will be costs, right? Being committed to something bigger, something noble, something lofty will not in and of itself close the gap between the Jewish people and the nations of the world, but it may provide a pathway, as imagined in this Gemara, for some possible redemption in which we can live side by side with the nations of the world. I'm not interested in cheap redemption, cheap messianism, or cheap normalcy. I'm interested in the question of what does it mean for the Jewish people to remain obedient to the covenant through a long, dark period of otherness without having to come to the conclusion that that otherness is irredeemable. I've sensed for some time uh, that nationalism today, as it's, as it's imagined, both by Judeo-pessimism and by radical messianism, becomes an enemy of Jewish peoplehood. And I'm trying to suggest today that this doesn't need to be the case. Thank you.